In the green and lush region of Thrace, under the golden glow of the sun, a child was born destined to change the world with his music. His name was Orpheus, and from birth, he showed signs of extraordinary talent. He was the son of Calliope, one of the nine muses who inspired artists, and Egro, the god of the river that meandered through Thrace. With such lineages, one could say that music and poetry ran through his veins. As Orpheus grew older, his skill with music became more and more evident. When he was just a boy, villagers would gather around him, marveling at the melodies he produced even with simple instruments made of reeds and strings. But everything changed the day Apollo, god of the sun and music, gave him a lyre. It was a recognition of his potential and a gift that would connect him even more deeply to the power of music. With the lyre in his hands, Orpheus' skill reached divine levels. His fingers danced on the strings, creating melodies that not only enchanted his listeners but also influenced the natural world. On numerous occasions, stunned villagers would watch as the wildest wild beasts approached Orpheus, lying at his feet in a state of calm. Trees seemed to lean toward him, and rocks seemed to vibrate to the rhythm of his music. Stories of his prodigious talent spread throughout Greece. People from distant lands would travel for days on end just to hear Orpheus perform. They said his music could heal broken hearts, bring peace to troubled minds, and make the most reluctant shed tears of emotion. But beyond his fame and skill, what stood out about Orpheus was his genuine passion for music. Every note he played emanated from the core of his being, and those who listened to him felt they were connecting directly with his soul. Despite his growing fame, he remained humble, always looking for ways to improve and explore the limits of what music could achieve. And as Thrace resonated with the melodies of Orpheus, fate had in store for him an encounter that would change his life forever. The forest was quiet, with only the gentle rustle of leaves swaying in the breeze. Orpheus, absorbed in his music, did not expect anything to disturb that moment of peace. But then, among the trees, an ethereal figure emerged. It was Eurydice, a nymph with dark hair and eyes as bright as stars. As fate would have it, their paths crossed, and when their gazes met, the world seemed to stop. Orpheus' music took on a softer, sweeter tone. Drawn by the sound, Eurydice approached cautiously, each step so light that it barely left a footprint on the ground. Soon, the two were face to face, and in that silence, an invisible bond connected them. They began to spend time together, sharing stories and laughter. Orpheus played melodies that narrated his feelings, and Eurydice danced to the rhythm, expressing her joy and love. They both felt they were destined for each other. Stories of their love spread throughout Thrace, and the nymphs and satyrs of the forest celebrated their union. The wedding was a grandiose event, with gods and mortals alike wishing to bless the couple's union. Apollo, the god of the sun and music, offered blessings while Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, ensured that the couple would always be protected in the forest. However, as it usually happens in love stories, the happiness of Orpheus and Eurydice would not be without trials. At that moment, dancing under the starry sky, it seemed that nothing could separate them. In the days following their wedding, Eurydice used to wander through the woods, often accompanied by the distant sound of Orpheus' lyre. The world seemed to dance to the rhythm of their love, and the forest, with its birdsong and rustling leaves, became her refuge. One evening, as she walked alone among the trees, Aristeus, a shepherd known for his persistence and obsession with nymphs, saw her. Eurydice's beauty instantly enchanted him. With clear intentions, he approached her, trying to woo her with flattery and honeyed words. Eurydice, feeling uncomfortable and threatened, declined his advances and began to walk away quickly. But Aristeus, unable to accept her rejection, pursued her with renewed urgency. The young nymph, in her desperation, ran along unknown paths, straying from familiar paths. It was then that, during her hasty flight, Eurydice stepped on a snake hidden among the fallen leaves. The snake, in a defensive reflex, bit Eurydice on the ankle. The venom spread quickly, and although the pain was short-lived, its effects were deadly. Eurydice's vitality faded, and her eyes, once shining with love and joy, grew dull. When Orpheus found his beloved, 
Lying limp in the forest, the world seemed to stop. His lyre, which had always been a source of joy and comfort, now only reflected the abyss of his grief. The sad notes that rose from its strings echoed throughout the forest, echoing the tragedy that had changed his life forever. Orpheus' grief was so immense that every chord he struck echoed with heartbreaking sadness. Without Eurydice, the world would have lost its color and meaning. With unwavering determination, he decided to face the unthinkable, to descend into the dreaded underworld to rescue his beloved. The journey into the depths was perilous. The entrance to the underworld was hidden, a place where the sun did not shine and the shadows danced in an eternal game of darkness. However, the music of Orpheus guided him, and the lyre, with its vibrating strings, illuminated his path. Arriving at the river Styx, he met Sharon, the old ferryman who transported the souls of the dead to the other side. Sharon, accustomed to receiving a coin as payment, looked suspiciously at Orpheus. But he did not offer gold. Instead, he began to play a melody. The notes floated on the blackened water, and the power of the music made the old boatman mesmerized. Moved, he allowed Orpheus to cross without payment. Continuing his journey, Orpheus faced another challenge, Cerberus, the fearsome three-headed dog that guarded the gates of the underworld. The monster's jaws gave off a venomous breath and his eyes burned with hellish ferocity. But again, music was the salvation. Orpheus began to play a lullaby, and the three heads of Cerberus fell heavily, plunged into a deep sleep. As he went on, Orpheus encountered more challenges, grieving souls seeking solace, vengeful spirits trying to divert him from his path, and dark labyrinths that seemed to have no way out. But his love for Eurydice and the hope of seeing her again kept him steady. Finally, after overcoming all obstacles, Orpheus reached the heart of the underworld, where Hades' throne was located. Now, he had to face the greatest challenge of all, to persuade the god of the underworld. The underworld, a vast and dark realm, was illuminated by faint flames dancing on rivers of shadows. The souls of the dead wandered, their wailing filling the air with endless melancholy. But when Orpheus entered Hades' palace, all was silenced. His presence, a mortal in the realm of the dead, was a rarity that did not go unnoticed. Before him stood the majestic throne of Hades, carved from obsidian and surrounded by a halo of cold darkness. Beside him, Persephone, goddess of spring and queen of the underworld, watched with eyes full of curiosity and compassion. Bravely, Orpheus stepped forward, his lyre in hand. In a trembling voice, he pleaded, Great Hades, Lord of the Dead, I come to beg you for the life of my beloved Eurydice. Hades, with an impenetrable expression, nodded for him to continue. Orpheus then began to play. The strings of his lyre vibrated with a sweetness and sadness that had never been heard in that place. Each note seemed to tell a story of love, loss, and hope. The souls stopped their wandering, the rivers of shadows calmed, and for a brief moment, the underworld witnessed the beauty it had never known. Persephone's tears began to fall, and it was said that even Hades, whose heart was accustomed to the tragedies of humanity, was moved. When the melody was finished, silence took possession of the room. Persephone was the first to say, Never before have we heard such beautiful and moving music. Your love for Eurydice is evident in every note. Hades, after a deep sigh, nodded. You have reached the heart of this realm with your plea. I will grant you your wish, but on one condition. Orpheus affirmed, willing to accept any challenge for the sake of regaining his beloved. Hades' deep voice chimed, establishing the rule that would change the fate of the lovers. As Orpheus ascended the dark and winding paths of the underworld, the silhouette of Eurydice followed him silently. Although he could not see her, he trusted Hades' promise and the sound of delicate footsteps behind him. The air was thick and heavy, and each step carried with it a mixture of hope and anxiety. Shadows of lost souls whispered as he passed, some recognizing the great musician, others lamenting their own stories. But Orpheus, his mind fixed on his purpose, continued to move forward, concentrating on not breaking the one condition imposed. But as he neared the exit, fear began to infiltrate his heart, the light from the outside world was beginning to seep in, 
and with it doubts. The echoes of the underworld were becoming more distant, and the silence surrounding them was becoming deafening. Eurydice's footsteps, once clear, now seemed to fade. What if Hades has betrayed me? He thought. What if this is all a cruel game and Eurydice is not behind me? Doubts consumed Orpheus until, in a moment of desperation, he turned his head to make sure his beloved was there. His eyes met Eurydice's, so close to the threshold of the world of the living. But, having broken the condition, she began to back away, her hands outstretched towards him, an expression of sadness and surprise on her face. Orpheus tried to run toward her, but an invisible force stopped him. He could feel the wrenching pain in his heart as he watched Eurydice being dragged back into the shadows of the underworld, disappearing from his sight and his life forever. The silence of the underworld was replaced by the wail of Orpheus, a wail that would echo in legends and songs throughout the ages. The only chance to win back his beloved had vanished by a simple glance, a moment of doubt. After the painful setback in the underworld, Orpheus became a shadow of his former self. The melody of his lyre, which had once been joyful and lively, was now suffused with sadness and despair. Avoiding cities and towns, he wandered through forests and mountains, seeking refuge in nature. Although his fame as the greatest musician who ever lived remained intact, Orpheus avoided human company. It is said that he even rejected the company and amorous advances of many women, choosing to live in solitude and constantly remembering his beloved Eurydice. The music he played during this period reflected his grief, but, even so, animals, trees, and even rocks gathered around him, sharing his sorrow. However, his decision to reject women was not well received by all. A group of Menads, frenzied followers of the god Dionysus, were offended by his snubs. The Menads were known for their wild celebrations in honor of Dionysus and were not accustomed to being ignored or rejected. One day, while Orpheus was playing his lyre on a hill, he was surprised by these maddened Menads. Irritated by his constant rejection and seeing him as a challenge to their god, they decided to punish him. In a violent frenzy, they attacked and tore him to pieces. Birds, beasts, and trees mourned Orpheus' death. The muses, saddened by the death of one of their own, gathered up his remains and buried them on the slopes of Mount Olympus. It is said that his tomb emanated sweet melodies and that birds flocked to it to hear the echo of his music. Although Orpheus no longer walked among mortals, his musical legacy lived on. And, as ancient legends say, he finally found peace and was reunited with his beloved Eurydice in the afterlife.